Hey there, Linux enthusiasts. Welcome back to Ton Does Linux and More. I'm Ton, and if you're new here, this is your go-to channel for everything Linux, from beginner tutorials to the latest news that's shaking up the open source world. And folks, this week has been absolutely wild in the Linux ecosystem. We've got some incredible performance improvements coming to the kernel, some serious corporate drama that's got the community talking, and updates that could change how you use Linux on a daily basis. Today we're covering major kernel updates, including a massive OpenVPN performance boost, the latest distribution releases, desktop environment news, and some community drama that you absolutely need to know about. So grab your favorite beverage, settle in, and let's dive into this week's Linux news. All right, let's kick things off with some absolutely fantastic news from the kernel development front. This week brought us some major announcements that are going to impact how we use Linux, especially if you're running VPNs or working with network intensive applications. The biggest story has to be OpenVPN's data channel offload or DCO getting officially green lit for inclusion in the Linux kernel. Now, if you're not familiar with DCO, let me break this down for you in simple terms. Traditionally, when you're using OpenVPN, your data has to travel between user space and kernel space for encryption and routing. Think of it like having to go through multiple security checkpoints every time you want to enter a building. It works, but it's not exactly efficient. With DCO, all of that processing happens directly in the kernel space, which means we're eliminating those costly trips back and forth. The performance improvements are absolutely staggering. We're talking about up to 300% better performance compared to configurations not using DCO. That's not a typo, folks. 300%. What makes this even more impressive is that DCO is multi-threaded, which means it can split up tasks and assign them to different CPU cores. If you're running a business that relies heavily on VPN connections, or if you're just someone who values fast, secure connections, this is gonna be a game changer. The best part, this will be included by default in kernel 6.16. So you won't need to install any external components or jump through hoops to get these benefits. Speaking of kernel 6.16, Linus Torvalds announced the first release candidate just this past Sunday. For those keeping track, this means the merge window is now closed and we are in the testing phase. The final release is expected sometime in late July or early August, depending on how many release candidates we see. Now, 6.16 isn't just about OpenVPN improvements. We're getting some really exciting features across the board. There's new Intel Auto Counter Reload support, Intel APX support for those running cutting edge hardware, and some significant improvements to the Bcache FS file system. If you're using NVIDIA hardware, you'll be happy to know there's better support for Hopper and Blackwell GPUs in the Nouveau driver. The ext4 file system is getting large folio support for regular files, which should improve performance for applications that work with large files. There's also multi-fs block atomic write support for big alloc file systems, which is great news for database administrators and anyone working with high performance storage systems. Now with all this excitement about 6.16, we also need to talk about kernel 6.14 reaching end of life. Released back in March, kernel 6.14 introduced some great features like BTRFS RAID 1 rebalancing and the NSYNC subsystem for Windows NT synchronization primitives. But as of this week, it's officially reached end of life, which means no more security updates or bug fixes. If you're still running 6.14, now's the time to upgrade to 6.15, which was released on May 25th with its own set of improvements including enhanced Rust support for HR Timer and ARM v7 architectures. The Linux kernel development cycle moves fast, and staying current is crucial for both security and performance. This week brought us some significant updates in the enterprise Linux space, and I'm particularly excited about what Rocky Linux has been up to. Rocky Linux 9.6 just dropped, and it's bringing some features that are going to make a lot of Windows users very happy. The headline feature here is new Windows subsystem for Linux support. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Ton, why would I want to run Linux inside Windows when I could just run Linux natively? And you're absolutely right to think that way. 
But the reality is, many of us work in mixed environments where we need to use Windows for certain applications while still having access to our beloved Linux tools. Rocky Linux's WSL integration means you can now have a full Rocky Linux environment running seamlessly alongside your Windows applications. This is particularly valuable for developers who need to test applications across different environments, system administrators managing hybrid infrastructures, or anyone who's stuck with Windows at work but wants their Linux tools readily available. Beyond WSL support, Rocky 9.6 includes updated packages across the board, enhanced security features, and improved hardware support. The Rocky Linux team has been doing an excellent job maintaining compatibility with Red Hat Enterprise Linux while adding their own improvements and optimizations. Not to be outdone, Oracle Linux 9.6 also made its debut this week, bringing the unbreakable Enterprise Kernel 8 and enhanced security features. Oracle's approach to Enterprise Linux has always been interesting, they take the Red Hat base and add their own kernel optimizations and enterprise features. UEK8 brings improved performance for database workloads, better container support, and enhanced security features that are particularly relevant for enterprise deployments. Moving beyond enterprise distributions, VirtualBox 7.1.10 ruled out with improvements for both Windows and Linux users. If you're using VirtualBox for development, testing, or just experimenting with different distributions, this update brings better performance, improved hardware support, and bug fixes that make the virtualization experience smoother. One of the things I really appreciate about VirtualBox is how it democratizes virtualization. You don't need expensive enterprise software to run multiple operating systems on your machine. Whether you're a student learning about different Linux distributions, a developer testing applications across multiple platforms, or just someone who likes to experiment, VirtualBox makes it accessible. Speaking of tools that make Linux more accessible, FastFetch 2.45 arrived this week with new GPU vendor detection capabilities. If you're not familiar with FastFetch, it's a system information tool that's become incredibly popular for its speed and customization options. The new GPU detection features mean you'll get more accurate information about your graphics hardware, which is particularly useful if you're running multiple GPUs or working with newer hardware that wasn't previously recognized. What I love about tools like FastFetch is how they represent the Linux philosophy of having powerful, lightweight tools that do one thing really well. Instead of bloated system information utilities, you get a fast, efficient tool that gives you exactly the information you need without unnecessary overhead. The enterprise Linux space continues to evolve rapidly, and it's fascinating to see how different distributions are carving out their niches. Rocky Linux is focusing on compatibility and ease of migration from CentOS. Oracle is emphasizing performance and enterprise features. And the broader ecosystem is becoming more diverse and robust than ever. While enterprise distributions are evolving, the desktop environment space has been equally busy with some exciting developments. The desktop environment scene has been absolutely buzzing this week, and KDE is leading the charge with not just software updates, but also some bold marketing moves that have caught the entire Linux community's attention. Let's start with the technical updates. KDE Gear 25.04.2 just landed, bringing improvements across the entire suite of KDE applications. For those who might be new to the KDE ecosystem, Gear is their collection of applications that work seamlessly with the Plasma desktop environment. We're talking about everything from file managers and text editors to multimedia applications and development tools. But here's where things get really interesting. KDE launched what they're calling the Windows 10 Exiles campaign. And folks, this is marketing genius. With Microsoft ending support for Windows 10 in October 2025, millions of users are going to be faced with a choice. Upgrade their hardware to run Windows 11 or find an alternative. KDE is positioning Linux with the Plasma desktop as the smart alternative. Their campaign message is brilliant. Your computer is not broken. Don't throw it away. 
they're directly addressing the frustration many users feel about being forced to upgrade perfectly functional hardware just to continue receiving security updates. What's particularly clever about this campaign is how it frames the migration. Instead of positioning Linux as a compromise or a good enough alternative, KDE is presenting it as an upgrade. You get better performance, more customization options, enhanced privacy, and freedom from corporate lock-in. For many users, especially those frustrated with Windows' increasing focus on cloud services and data collection, this message resonates strongly. Now, folks, this is where this week gets really interesting and frankly, a bit controversial. We need to talk about what's happening with the Ex Libre project and the broader implications for the Linux community. This story has everything, corporate politics, developer drama, and fundamental questions about the future of Linux desktop technologies. Developer Enrico Weigelt, who has been one of the most active contributors to the Xorg project, was banned from the free desktop org infrastructure by Red Hat employees. And we're not talking about a temporary suspension here. His account was deleted, his repositories were removed, and more than 140 merge requests were closed. All of his work essentially erased from the official infrastructure. To understand why this matters, we need to step back and look at the bigger picture. X11, the windowing system that has powered Linux desktops for decades, is being phased out in favor of Wayland. Most major distributions and desktop environments have already made the switch or are in the process of doing so. The argument is that Wayland is more modern, more secure, and better suited for contemporary computing needs. Weigel's response was to fork Xorg into a new project called X Libre, with the explicit goal of revitalizing X11 development outside of what he sees as corporate influence. His statement is pretty direct. He accuses Red Hat of trying to kill X11 to eliminate competition and push everyone toward Wayland. What's particularly interesting is Weigel's comparison to Keith Packard's situation nearly two decades ago. Packard faced similar exclusion from the XFree86 project, which eventually led to the creation of Xorg. That transition marked the end of XFree86 and established Xorg as the dominant X11 implementation. Weigelt is clearly hoping for a similar outcome with Xlibre. But here's the reality check. Reviving X11 is an enormous undertaking. We're talking about a code base that's incredibly complex. With decades of accumulated technical debt and compatibility requirements, the reason most of the industry is moving to Wayland isn't just corporate politics. X11 has fundamental architectural limitations that make it difficult to secure and optimize for modern hardware. The community reaction has been mixed. Some developers and users see this as an important stand against corporate control of open source projects. Others view it as a quixotic effort to revive technology that's legitimately obsolete. The truth, as usual, probably lies somewhere in between. Speaking of community decisions, Debian maintainers made the controversial choice to request delisting of Hyperland from Debian 13 Trixie. Hyperland is a dynamic tiling Wayland compositor that's gained a significant following among power users who want highly customizable window management. The official reason given is that the current version in Debian's repositories is lagging behind upstream by several versions and the maintainers are having difficulty keeping up with the rapid development pace. However, the timing and coordination of the bug reports that prompted this decision have led some community members to suspect there might be more to the story. This highlights a broader challenge in the Linux ecosystem, balancing stability with innovation. Debian's approach has always been conservative, prioritizing stability and thorough testing over having the latest features. But when that approach conflicts with rapidly evolving projects like Hyperland, it can lead to situations where users have to choose between stability and functionality. On a more positive note, the community also saw the introduction of Carton, which is being positioned as KDE's answer to GNOME Boxes and Vert Manager. Carton is a libvert-powered virtualization management tool that aims to make virtual machine management more accessible to desktop users. What's interesting about Carton is how it represents the ongoing competition between desktop environments to provide complete integrated experiences. 
Rather than relying on third-party tools, both KDE and GNOME are developing their own solutions for common tasks like virtualization management. Another interesting project that emerged this week is Graffito, a systemd journal log viewer with a beautiful web interface. For system administrators who need to analyze log files across multiple systems, having a clean, web-based interface can be incredibly valuable. Tools like Graffito demonstrate how the Linux ecosystem continues to evolve and improve the user experience. Instead of being stuck with command line tools that require memorizing complex syntax, we're seeing more intuitive interfaces that make powerful functionality accessible to a broader range of users. What a week it's been in the Linux world. We've seen incredible technical advances like OpenVPN's kernel integration promising 300% performance improvements, exciting distribution updates that make Linux more accessible to Windows users, and community drama that raises important questions about corporate influence in open source projects. The common thread through all of these stories is that Linux continues to evolve and mature. Whether it's kernel developers optimizing performance, distribution maintainers improving user experience, or community members standing up for their vision of what open source should be, the ecosystem is vibrant and constantly improving. If you found this week's roundup valuable, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any of our Linux content. We cover everything from beginner tutorials to advanced system administration, and of course, these weekly news roundups to keep you informed about what's happening in the Linux world. Are you excited about the OpenVPN performance improvements? What do you think about the XLibre controversy? I read every comment and love hearing your perspectives. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and remember, with Linux, you're not just using an operating system. You're part of a community that's shaping the future of computing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.